Welcome back to Just Between Us. It's time for the juiciest, <laughs> most scandalous, controversial segment known to all of podcasting. <laughs> Tough questions. <laughs> this week on the show, we have Janet Hardy. Janet is the author or co-author of 13 books about alternative sexuality, including the groundbreaking bestseller, The Ethical Slut. She has traveled the world sharing the knowledge she has gained through life as a polyamorous, bisexual, genderqueer, and lately geezer. Oh, <laughs> Janet lives in Eugene, Oregon with her spouse and too many pets. Hello, Janet. Hello, hello. I have given the ethical slut to literally everyone I know. Um, and so can you talk about like what the book is about for listeners who don't know? Um, the book is about uh, ways to have an ethical and happy life that may not be monogamous. Ways to manage multiple people in your life so everyone is getting their needs met and having fun. And do it all above, above board and honestly and work your way through whatever comes up. And can you talk a little bit about your journey to figuring that out? Because uh, you kind of got married young and you didn't necessarily see this as the road for your life, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I married my college boyfriend. Um, I was 21, barely. Um, and he was a, a year older. And we had a couple of kids and I worked as an advertising copywriter and time passed and all of a sudden I went wait, did I sign up? I don't remember signing up for this. <laughs> and I was in the process of coming out as kinky. Um, mm -hmm. And he tried, but it wasn't his thing. So some people are just vanilla and he's one of them. And so we came apart. I would like to boast that we came apart very sweetly uh, mm -hmm. and continue to be good friends. And what does it mean to, to come out as kinky? I don't know if everyone's heard that the phrase. This is going to be hard for people the age of your audience to understand, but we're talking about the late 70s, early 80s. I was a 20 or 30 something young woman in the suburbs, and I still thought I was the only person in the world who got turned on thinking about spanking. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, a right? beautiful, a beautiful, simple time. <laughs> <laughs> so pure, so innocent. Um, yeah. And once I sort of figured out that there were other people with similar fantasies and that we could play together, that's what I wanted. But how did you find those people at the time? And how did you like, it's funny to to frame it as coming out, even though I know like nowadays I would even, I would say I'm 32. I would say that is accurate. Yeah. Like no, a thing that you have to do. It definitely wasn't coming out and very typical of comings out. First, I had to come out to myself. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the hardest step, I think, is mm -hmm. to acknowledge, you know, I'd been having these intense fantasies since I, since earliest memory, really. But it took me a long time to figure out that they were sex fantasies because there was no sex in them or not anything I recognized as sex. And then I had to talk to my spouse and we tried to negotiate some options. And none of them were quite working for us. Mm -hmm. And then once the marriage ended, I came out to everyone, perhaps more people than I should have given <laughs> I still did have you know, my ex and I shared joint physical and legal custody of my kids. And so, you know, I, there were kids involved. How did you find other like-minded people at the time? In the time? beginning, in personal ads, um, mm -hmm. in the newspaper. And of course, personal ads in a mainstream newspaper could not ask for what they were asking for. So you have to read the code. They, oh. they would say things like, I want a goddess to put on a pedestal. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. <laughs> um, the word strict is usually a pretty good clue what's going on. Worship. It, it was all there in the code, but you have to learn to read it first. I love looking at those old queer personal ads. They're so amazing. Oh, the, the queer ones were great, but I, I'm talking the Sacramento Bee here because I was living in Sacramento. <laughs> um, so, you know, just an ordinary everyday paper. And then later, my girlfriend and I were um, vacationing together in New Orleans. And we walked past something and did a double take because it was a leather store, a kink leather store. I believe it's still there. And we went in. It was the first time either of us had ever been in a store like that. We'd been doing a little play on our own. But, uh, you know, this was the this was not the kiddie pool anymore. There was <laughs> stuff in there. We didn't even know what it was. But one of the things I picked up was a copy of a magazine that was popular at that time in Kickland called the San Utopia Guardian, which is S&M Utopia. Very mm -hmm. clever. Um, and that had personal ads in it where you could actually ask for what you wanted. Right. Uh, and you didn't have to censor yourself. So I met a guy through one of those personal ads and we didn't click, but we went together into San Francisco to go to a Society of Janus event, which was the kink group in San Francisco. And that was when I found my community. 
mm-hmm. and also where I met the guy that I was with for the next 13 years. So, oh my uh, God. Yeah. How did you come to writing The Ethical Slut? <laughs> Dossie and I had already done two kink books, the bottoming book and the topping book. Um, and, and we were talking, you know, doing workshops and lectures and so on about kink. And we were invited to do a talk about kink at a Mensa gathering in Asilomar, California. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and we, we did our little entry level SM talk. And that night there was a gathering down at the hot tubs. And I ran into a friend of mine just leaving as I was heading down there. And she said, you should have heard, heard what they were talking about in my hot tub. And I said, okay, I'll bite. <laughs> she said the conversation was, did you hear about that S&M talk this morning? There were these two women giving it, and they were talking about stuff they had done together. And one of their boyfriends was right in the room, <laughs> which was the first, you know, we, we had both been poly and most of our community been poly for years. Mm-hmm. And that was the first glimmering we got that there was a market for information about how to do poly well but mm-hmm. that you know we thought the kink stuff was the shocking thing that wasn't the shocking thing you know the thing about kink is if it's not your thing you can tune it out yeah mm-hmm. that's that thing that those weird people do I don't have to think about that but everybody has to make decisions about how they want their relationships shaped so mm-hmm. poly gets right up in people's faces in a way that kink never did but we, we didn't expect the book to do much you know we thought we had written another weird little niche book for our weird little niche market mm-hmm. and it took off out from under us and uh, you know we're go- we're over three hundred thousand copies sold last i looked i'm wow. one hundred thousand of them okay. <laughs> <laughs> i honestly you know i the first edition which is back in 1997 i published myself in my little publishing company greenery press and so I was the one filling the orders and I would see orders come in from one person wanting six copies. And uh-huh. I really think that's part of how the book got popular is everybody bought lots of them to give out to all their lovers. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there, <laughs> there are many publishers in the world that would sacrifice body parts for something uh, like that. We yeah. <laughs> so you talked about having to come out as, as kinky. And then did you feel like you also had to come out as polyamorous or did those two sort of go hand in hand or was that a separate journey? They were not sequential, but not simultaneous. Uh, one of the stages my then husband and I went through in trying to figure out this new thing in our lives was to talk about opening the relationship. Mm-hmm. And I think if we had had a community or a book like The Ethical Slut, we might have very well managed that, but we didn't. We didn't know how. So once he and I split up, I was pretty determined not to be monogamous again. And so I had a, a nice circle of fuck buddies and I was happy. And then I met Jay and... Uh, went from there. Can you, you touched on this a little bit. What scares people so much about polyamory? So I thought about it afterwards and I thought, okay, if I were this woman and I were maybe 50 or 60 years old and I had been monogamous, maybe not happily, but monogamous all my life because I had been taught that was the only ethical way to be. And this woman comes on the radio and says, no, you don't have to do that. There are lots of ways to be uh, happy in a relationship. You don't have to do monogamy. I would be freaking furious. Yeah. (laughs) And I would probably not be evolved enough to be furious at myself or at the people who had told me an untruth. Mm, I'd be furious at the lady on the radio. And so, you know, I try to have compassion uh, Mm -hmm. because a lot of people have been fed a lot of half-truths at best. And it's the water we swim in. It's really easy not to see it if you happen to be a fish. I don't get angry at people like that. I just try to gently suggest that, you know, if monogamy is what you want, excellent. I think monogamy is a terrific way to live. What I think though, is that it's not the only way to live. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of different ways to form relationships. And if that's the one you want, you should have that and not feel like you have to defend it. But if it's not the one you want, I can help you find the one that you do. Yeah, I think that it causes people to question their own relationships and they don't want to. Like exactly. They're like, I don't want other choices. Now I'm freaking out because my partner might want that. Now now I'm being told that I didn't have to suffer. It's like this, yeah, I think they're, they're just like, no, I don't want to have to think about this. This is the way things are. And they get like real panicked about yeah. it. Having lots of choices is hard. Yeah, uh, it's it's really easier, you know. The unexamined uh, unexamined life may not be worth living, but it's a lot easier, um, <laughs> and it's very 
confronting to be faced with these options when particularly if you're a little bit older and you've never heard of anything different. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we encountered this basically anywhere that we are public people, Dossie and me, uh, yeah. when we write articles or go on TV or whatever, it comes up. There's a lot of people who are really triggered by our message. It's gotten better. The book will be 30 years old next year. Is that right? And in that time, Polly has become much more widely understood. Mm -hmm. There was a Newsweek cover story a few years back, which was sort of when we knew, okay, we've crossed over the threshold on this (laughs) one. Um, Weirdly, the time that we got the most press inquiries and interest was after the news story about Newt Gingrich asking his wife for an open relationship. Oh, Our wow. Bones rang off the freaking hook. And if you had asked us when we came out with this book, who's going to be the person that most gets people interested in your message, Newt Gingrich would not have been <laughs> off the list. Unfortunately, he was not doing this in a very ethical way. So mm-hmm. we had to have many caveats about just because Newt is doing it doesn't mean he's doing it right. But there right. are ways to do it right. Yeah, I think people think that it's like a free for all or they think that it means that you don't love each other because some people right, like have not examined this parts of themselves. And so, you know, I know a couple where they were living together. They, you know, he was planning on proposing to her and then she came to him and, and said that she needed to have an open relationship. And this was something that like she'd never expressed before. Um, it, it was not something that like he was interested in and they tried to make it work kind of similar to what you were talking about originally with, with your marriage. Is there any way to make that relationship work when one person realizes that they want that and the, and the other person is not interested in it? Yes, I have seen a few relationships between a poly person and a monogamous person. It tends to happen when one person has either a much stronger sex drive than the other person or when one person wants a kind of sex that the other can't or won't provide. Mm -hmm. For example, if you're bisexual and you want uh, want to have sex with someone opposite your or different than your partner's sex, that's a, a way to make it work so that you might have a squeeze on the outside that is the gender you're hungry for and then come home to your spouse. We interviewed a couple, we interviewed them in the first edition of Slot nearly 30 years ago. And then on this most recent edition, which is a couple years back, we went and talked to them again. And they were a couple like that. One of them is extremely poly and the other is uh, pretty monogamous. I think he may have had a fling or two, but he doesn't really want to. And they're still together after 30 years. They've raised their kids together. Um, It's working fine for them. So it can work. It's one of the rarer configurations in Uh, relationship land, but um, it can work. I think people think that if you're poly, jealousy doesn't happen, but that is not true. It's just, I mean, just a matter of like working through that jealousy or not finding that jealousy to be like unhealthy or something. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, Anybody who has raised two children or for that matter, two dogs knows that jealousy (laughs) is not a thing that goes away. Um, If you give my two dogs two bones, identical bones, they will each drop theirs and go over and get the other dogs (laughs) because they're dogs. Um, (laughs) I think this has gotten better in the years I've been part of the poly community. It used to be that it was pretty common to hear people say something like, I can't do poly, I'm too jealous, or you're a bad poly person because you feel jealous. Right. Everybody feels jealous sometimes. Some people more, some people less. The difference about being poly is that when you have a feeling of jealousy when you're poly, you don't ask your partner to be the one who fixes it. You may ask for some kinds of support. Um, You may ask for some reassurance or some time together or whatever it might help to make you feel less that way, but it's mostly your internal work to soothe yourself and find a way past this difficult emotion in the same way that if you're angry, you you find your way through it. Or when you're grieving, you find your way through it. It's part of being human. And I do want to note here that I I was in a monogamous marriage for a long time and I've known so many monogamous people and I have not noticed that monogamy is the antidote to jealousy. So... (laughs) Yeah, people, monogamous people do feel jealous. It's not like you're going to avoid jealousy by being monogamous. Exactly. So if you're going to have a relationship, you're going to have tough times. Mm -hmm. That's the nature of being in a relationship. And it's Mm -hmm. just a matter of what kind of tough times you want to have and how you want to handle them when you have them. Can you talk about the intersection of poly and queerness? So obviously, you and I are different generations. 
I'm even a different generation than our fan base, I think. So I'm bisexual and polyamorous. And there was a bit of a backlash. And now there is a, a bit of that where bisexuals I have found are very much like, no, I'm bisexual, but I'm monogamous. I'm bisexual, but I'm not a slut. Like all these kinds of things where it then caused this boomerang where those of us who, but I, I'm not offended if you want a threesome. I'm not offended if, you know, these types of things. And so I think it kind of came back around where like you even saying, oh, if you're bisexual and you want to be poly because you want, you want to be with different genders, there are people that would be like, that's, that's so like controversial. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, anytime a cultural movement is in its infancy, it's going to be kind of raw and kind of easily triggered and people are going to get very defensive because it's Mm -hmm. new. Um, And I certainly think that that happens often uh, around the phenomenon you describe. Um, Many, many bisexual people are monogamous. It's Mm -hmm. no sillier than a heterosexual person being monogamous in spite of the fact that they feel attraction to many people that are not their spouse. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, there's a big difference between attraction and fantasy and behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's fine and common to be bisexual and choose the behavior of being monogamous. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, many bisexual people are poly. And -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. Poly is one way of handling some of the uh, trickier parts of being bi. I don't think we needed to go hard into respectability politics, which is uh, something that often gets me in trouble for saying. I think it people think it plays into the idea of bisexual people being duplicitous or bisexual people being um, cheaters or, you know, if you're with a bi person, they're going to want something else. And the intersection of poly and queerness, where it's like the idea that almost every gay cis gay male relationship is open like that. Like I have had friends who cis gay men who want monogamy and other gay men are like, that's so basic. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or the assumption that they're open, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that Polly dovetails with queerness. Um, But I think it causes some backlash. I think the reason we see more acceptance of Polly in the queer communities is because once you have branded yourself I missed it in one way. It's a lot easier to to take on some more. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're if you're already a pariah because you're gay or bi or lesbian or whatever, yeah. then what have you got to lose? You might as well have what you want. <laughs> the fact that Dossie and I have both spent a lot of our lives loving gay men and being with gay men mm-hmm. is very much a factor in the book because uh, that's where we learned how to do this stuff. They've been at it for a lot longer than we have. They know how to be in a relationship that is not sexually monogamous, mm-hmm. and all the underlying attitudes of non-ownership and community. And I have to tell this story because it's one of my favorites. I I was talking to a gay man at a coffee event and he said, I've got the cure for jealousy. Said, okay, tell me. (laughs) I can make a lot more money if I get that one out there. (laughs) And he said, well, my boyfriend's boyfriend, who I didn't like very much, came over looking for our boyfriend who was not home. And he said, do you mind then if I take a nap and wait for him? Because I'm really tired. I don't want to drive home. It doesn't feel safe. Um, If I could just crash in your spare room, uh, that would be a lot better. And he couldn't think of a reason to say no. So he said, okay, and showed him through to the spare room. And the guy curled up and went to sleep. The guy I was talking to said, and I walked in there, looked at him, and he looked so sweet and so relaxed. And I couldn't be mad anymore. I couldn't feel jealous anymore. I wound up curling up and taking a nap with him. Um, (laughs) That's one of my favorite Polly stories because it's the moment when this thing that feels intolerably threatening suddenly isn't. Mm -hmm. And I think many Polly people hit a moment like that, although maybe not that adorable uh, along their journey. Queer people may be a little bit better at making those opportunities for themselves. Again, when it's you against the world, community or chosen family becomes a lot more important Mm -hmm. and chosen family can easily turn into poly. It doesn't have to, but it often does. And so it's just a world 
that doesn't have the expectation of a nuclear family. Mm -hmm. And so you can feel free to explore. What was your experience like kind of discovering this new lifestyle for yourself while also being a mom? I'm actually working on a book about that. If any of your viewers want to go look at it, it's at slutandsons.com, which is the name of the book. (laughs) And it's really too long a story to tell here. I I, I just want to say that before they turned 18, I was very careful, not because I thought it would damage them to know what their mom was up to in a general way. Obviously, I wasn't going to give them a blow by blow of my latest sex. But by that point in my life, I was a fairly visible person. I had a couple of books. I was running Greenery Press. And it doesn't take much looking at the past to recognize that if some Puritan wants to come after you, they're going to take a look at two things. One will be your taxes and the next will be your children. Right. Um, and I didn't think it would hurt them to know whatever I needed them to know, but I was not so confident about the rest of the world. So I was very careful when they were young. And then by the time they were grown, they both worked for me sometimes at the press. Both of them worked at trade shows with me, helping stock books and so on. They knew my other lovers. You know, I I didn't share details about which of them I was fucking and which I didn't. But I had a, a circle of friends who were sometimes sexual friends or play friends. And they were all friends of my kids too. It was not difficult. I gather it did not do my older son's social life any harm at all to be known as the son of the author of the ethical <laughs> slut. <when he> <laughs> <laughs> um, that's really beautiful. I wanted to ask about the, the use of the word slut because you put it in slut and sons and all this kind of stuff. And again, like I think there's generational whatever, but can you talk about like why you chose to use that and use it again? It was kind of a joke between Dossie and me back at the beginning. That was what we called the book. She came up with it. And it was our working title. And the whole time we were working on the book, we were thinking, yeah, this is cute. This is funny. But when we finish the book, we're going to have to think of a real title. (laughs) And so we sat down and made this list of incredibly boring and dry titles, like, you know, consensual non-monogamy in the 21st century, or, you know, just horrible textbooky things. And nothing suited. And finally, you know, the book was done. We had to design the cover and get it off to the printer and we couldn't think of anything else. So it was with some considerable worry that we actually decided to use it as our title. And of course it's paid off a thousandfold. Um, Mm -hmm. It's a big part of why the book has been the success it has. But at the time we were not thrilled. Have you gotten pushback about it? Occasional. I was in a documentary that some girls in Canada were making about the word slut. And the overall direction of the movie was agitating for not using the word slut ever because people have had their feelings hurt by it. And I was the the opposition in the movie. And what I said is basically if a word that means a person that has a lot of sex is an insult to you, then I think you need to look at why that is. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, where I come from, having a lot of sex is a good thing. Mm -hmm. There has been pushback in the same way that any of the reclaimed words that we, you know, these days there are queer studies departments at universities, but my older gay male friends hate the word queer because it. one one of my friends says it's the last word you hear before a fist in your stomach. So it's the same kind of thing. Our generation grew up thinking that it was a deadly insult to call someone a slut. And um, I doubt that that'll change anytime soon. Of course, since there have been the slut walks and all that, it's Mm. gotten a lot less fraught. But for many people, it is still fraught. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if it kept like normie people from getting the book. Do you know what I mean? Possibly. You know, the book has sold amazingly. (laughs) I'm I'm really not too worried about it. I, I similarly feel like if if you're not going to pick it up because of that word, then it wasn't for you anyway. Yeah. The, the lesbian fisting orgy might be an obstacle for normal people anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I'm curious about your thoughts about the younger queer generation. I know as someone who, you know, went through the 80s and 90s, and I think during the pandemic, I've been reading a lot about HIV and AIDS oh. uh, just because... I, I'm trying. I'm all of a sudden very interested in like queer history. How do you view 
like this new generation. Cause I, I, in high school, I was like deathly afraid to be out. Now there's like 17 year olds who have like bi kinky, she, her, whatever in their bio. Uh, so how do you view all of that? Uh, I think it's marvelous. Uh, I think like any new movement, it gets a little extremist and then it settles down. And so right now people are very triggery and touchy about a lot of this stuff. But the thing is, when I speak to college aged audiences these days, there are significant numbers of second generation generation poly people in my audience in one case a third generation poly person whose grandparents and parents had all been poly Mm -hmm. Um, and so I really am eager to see what these kids are going to make of the world when they don't have to start from ignorance and judgment the way we did Mm -hmm. Uh, I I can't begin to imagine what they're going to build from that except I'm pretty sure I'm going to like it (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so you wrote a, a memoir called Impervious Confessions of a Semi-Retired Deviant. Yes, that's my second memoir, actually. And oh, my son's is my third. My first one was Girl Fag, A Life Told in Sex and Musicals. Um, <laughs> but what do you mean by semi-retired? I am not actively playing anymore, unless a dear friend happens to wander into town, in which case I make an exception, you know, someone mm-hmm. that I've known for a long time and love. I'll be 66 in a couple of weeks. I have had so many sexual adventures over many decades and I'm kind of done. Yeah. I'm not saying I might not wake up tomorrow morning going, hey, fuck this. I'm going to want to go play with everybody again. But so far, I'm kind of done. Does that affect your sense of identity in any way? It did at first. Uh, I had to sort of figure out what it meant to be a sex educator that wasn't having sex. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I've had some amazing journeys and come back. And, you know, I thought when I came out as being basically celibate that I would lose my audience. But no, they love it. My audience has gotten bigger since I've started talking about that journey all the way to the far end and back again. Whatever wisdom I've gained along the way is something people need to hear. And the number of people who have been emboldened by someone like me coming out as celibate because they are too and they've been ashamed to say anything. Yeah. It's been far more than I expected. Yeah, I think people think that poly or kink or any of that stuff is like a lifelong thing or it's always happening. And like, you know, similarly, like I go through phases. I'm like more interested in things, less interested in things. I'm not like, constantly, you know, I have a, I have a primary partner. I'm not like constantly doing other things. I think there's the misconception that it's all fun and games. I think there's the misconception that you're having sex all the time. I think there's the misconception that it's somehow easier or more like freewheeling than monogamy yeah. when like in my experience, it's been a lot of Google Docs and talking. Like, yep. I don't think it's as sexy as people imagine. I, I, I'm friends with a young woman online that I've never met. Mm -hmm. Um, and I found out after we've been talking for months that she thought that Polly meant that you were having sex every night with different people. And, you know, it may be months with any given person or even years. Yeah. I know Polly people who are out almost every night getting it Mm -hmm. on. And I know other Polly people who are like me and haven't gotten it on in years. Right. And everything in between. Polly is about being open to things, not about doing things. You can, in the mm-hmm. same way that being bisexual doesn't necessarily mean having sex with more than right. more than one gender. It, it may mean having sex with one gender, but knowing in yourself that you're attracted to other genders. Mm-hmm. Polly's the same thing. You know? Yeah. If Edward or I were to wake up tomorrow morning and go, you know, I really need to go find another partner because I'm really needing to go get laid. Uh, It's there for us. We Mm -hmm. we have a few words about it to make sure we were reading off the same page, but we've never ruled that out. But so far it hasn't happened. We just celebrated our 15th anniversary last month. Um, It hasn't happened. How have you like witnessed anything about Polly during the pandemic? I found it quite interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm not hands-on anymore, so to speak, and because I now live in Eugene rather rather than in a major urban center, I don't see how this is playing out on the ground. I think a lot of us from the poly community are amused by the rest of the world discovering what we've been calling fluid bonding all along, which is that you have your bubble and you don't wear your mask when you're in your bubble in the same way that we don't practice safer sex with our fluid bonded partners. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if you step outside, 
and share air or virus or whatever with others, you use protective devices. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it, it took the pandemic to teach the rest of the world how to do that. But we've been doing it all along as a way of uh, keeping ourselves free of disease. It's been super interesting just from I'm on TikTok watching the youngins and mm-hmm. it's been super interesting to me. And also in my- listening to you say youngins. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. <laughs> it's, I'm talking about like the 21 year olds. I'm 32, but okay. and they're total. They're different than me for sure. Yeah, they are. It's been interesting to and, and for me as well um, to be going on Zoom dates or texting with people. And I think it's allowed for a little bit more freedom in some ways, like mm-hmm. I've started like this gender journey because of talking to people in a sexual way, uh, uh, virtually that felt safer. And so I've noticed also, you know, during the pandemic, a jump in people having more of like a gender queer or figuring out that they are non-binary or like that kind of thing, because it's a little bit safer to be playing with that digitally (laughs) or virtually. And so like, I, you know, I think a lot of people are going to come out of the pandemic, like either figuring out that they're bisexual, figuring out that they're poly, figuring out they're queer, figuring out that their, their gender is different than they thought. And so I, I find it pretty exciting. All of that stuff is there to be experimented with. Mm -hmm. Uh, You you can't know what's going to work for you until you've tried a bunch of different things. And Mm -hmm. I love that the price people have to pay for experimenting is so much lower (laughs) <laughs> these days than it used to be. I mean, there's still a price. Don't kid yourself, but it's not right. what it was when I was a kid. I mean, I grew up in a world where it was illegal to be gay or to have sex with someone of your gender. Um, right. If you had told me when I was 16 and dating the first of the gay men who have made up most of my sexual life throughout my life, um, <laughs> that I would live to see gay marriage, I would have thought you were insane. Mm-hmm. And now it's so commonplace that unless we're like, QAnon or people like that, we don't even think about it. Anymore. Can we talk a little bit about about your relationships with gay men and and how it might be different than people perceive it or would assume it would be? I have always felt the most comfortable around gay men, the most at home. I've always felt like one of them. They don't necessarily feel the same way about me, sad to say, <laughs> but their subculture makes better sense to me than mine does. I think people who know me well recognize me as if not a gay man, then something very close to a gay man. And I don't expect that to change. My, my spouse, Edward, is what a lot of us who believe ourselves to be this way wind up with, which is a bisexual man that, mm-hmm. that vibes gay enough that I feel like I've got myself a gay man. I remember when we were first together, I was chatting with my sister, who is a lesbian. And she said, Edward was talking about his time in gay bars, and now I'm confused. Can you tell me what's going on there? And I said, yeah, it's easy. When I look at him, I see the gay man of my dreams. And when he looks at me, he sees the dyke of his dreams, and somehow it all works. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a really interesting litmus test, because when we're around someone who's queer, they read us as a gay man and a lesbian who have set up yep. housekeeping together. Um, mm-hmm. And when we're around someone who's straight, they assume that we're a regular hetero couple. Mm-hmm. And so we can follow their assumptions to find out what they're about. Right. It's it's very entertaining. <laughs> Is that what you mean in the title of Girl Fag? Yes. Has there been any pushback about oh, that God, title? Yes. Oh, God, yes. So much pushback. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't think the word fag, if it were used by an actual gay man, would have the kind of pushback. There would be some. But, there you know, is Dan, some, for yeah, sure. Dan, Dan, Dan Savage called his column Hey Faggot for years. Yeah. Um, and there was some pushback to him too, but not like what there would be. Uh, there are people who are really um, upset by the idea of a woman who identifies as a gay man. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I talked to one woman who was girl fag identified who called herself um, sexually trans. That's what mm-hmm. it was. And yeah, that's pretty close. That's a slightly less offensive way of talking about being a girl fag or a guy dyke, guy dyke is in my inner erotic self. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm attracted to people like me, but the people who are like me in my inner erotic self, self are men, mm-hmm. um, who are queer men. And so that's just been very consistent throughout my life. My fantasies from earliest fantasizing when I was itty bitty were of two men together. Since I became bisexual, sometimes women show up in my fantasies, but not nearly as often as two men together. 
I wrote about it a little bit in Girl Fag. An old family friend had come by with a male traveling companion. And at bedtime that night, I asked my mother uh, what that was about. I was maybe eight at the time. She said, do you know what ACDC means? And I said, no. <laughs> I, she said, well, you know how some ladies like to be in love with ladies and some men like to be in love with men. I said, yeah. And she said, he likes both. Yeah. And, Oh. That is, by the way, what ACDC means is bisexual, yes. which is yes. so I learned fun. that from my grandma. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's not even a term of my generation. It's a term of the generation before mine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my grandma said it in conversation a couple of years ago, and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think, doesn't that lead to sort of a, a gender journey for you, like Absolutely. identifying as genderqueer and that kind of thing? Yeah, I, I, the, the, word, the term I'm most comfortable with is gender nonconforming. Right. Um, but I really like being in the world as a masculine woman. Mm -hmm. I like showing that there are other ways to be female mm -hmm. than feminine. And if I were to transition, I would lose that. And that feels not as good to me as just being visibly and assertively who I am. Yeah. It's tough because there are things... I feel within the queer community that you can say and talk about. And then, and then when you, you can't really say it on a public platform, which is kind of like, right. So even in this episode with, with sort of the younger generation, like in my mind, do we put a trigger warning for the words dyke and fag? And you see uh, drag queens getting in trouble, getting dragged on LOL online because of using dyke or, or yeah. you'll see, you know, AFAB people being in trouble for using fag. And like, I may even face pushback for what I just said. So like, yep. ha, you know, <laughs> but then it's like, I'm queer. Like, can we not? Yeah. Remember what I said about movements in their inf infancy being extreme and touchy. Yeah. It just is what it is. Uh, Ms. Magazine used to have a regular column in it. Charter subscriber, by the way. I used to have a regular <laughs> column in it called Mid Revolutionary Mores. And I think when things like I, that's just the phrase I use, it's Mid Revolutionary mm -hmm. Mores. We, we don't know where we're going to fetch up with all this. So we're playing it by ear along the way. And that can be very triggery for people. It's not so black and white. And, yeah. and it's not, I think it's worth more nuance and context, you know? And I think like there are, trans friends of mine who use words for themselves that like I wouldn't use for them. They, I think publicly using that word would face backlash, even though they are trans. Like it's a really interesting time for language. And oh, for interesting is one word for it. <laughs> <laughs> if you start to posit that there are other genders beside male and female, mm -hmm. the whole concept of heterosexuality and homosexuality falls apart like sugar in water. Right. Um, and whether people have thought that through or not, they sense it and mm -hmm. they feel very uncomfortable with it. Right. Um, if you don't know what it means to be attracted to men because you don't know what men are, how do you, this incredibly important badge of identity that has meant so much to so many people in their lives, um, mm -hmm. what do you do if it's gone? I find it very liberating and fun to be who I am because I feel like I live outside of all of these things and I've gotten to experience life in such a um, more interesting way to me. <laughs> yes. I, you know, obviously I agree. Um, but yeah. mid-revolutionary mores, it's going to be difficult for a while. Mid-revolutionary mores. Just between.